So if we visualize the homunculus, it's going to be the patient. We'll just say it's a patient looking at us. So we typically see this side for the motor homunculus, so the left hemisphere. It's the left hemisphere, right? And then on this side, you typically see the uh, sensory homunculus when it's presented like in a textbook or online. But this, the homunculus is just showing you the motor strip for the patient and the sensory strip. The sensory and the motor strips really, as far as where the locations are along those respective strips, they really match up. So the area of the motor strip, for example, that controls the hand movement is going to be the same or generally the same area along the sensory strip where you feel tingling in your hands or you feel any type of sensation. So they're going to align topographically. If we were to look at the homunculus and then just rotate it down, so the so this patient, this image is looking at us and we're going to take it with our hands and rotate it down. Then we would see this uh, image right here of the brain, you can see, and you can see the electrodes. Now, the central sulcus, it's, it, there's a few terms for it, the Rolandic fissure, this black line kind of, well, a thin line right in here around this black line, black colored area, it's going to demarcate or separate the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe. The motor strip runs along or across from left to right, right there at the frontal lobe. And then just behind the that Rolandic fit, the central sulcus or Rolandic fissure, just behind that, but adjacent to the motor strip is going to be the sensory strip. So they, they're kind of paired up very close. One's in the parietal lobe, sensory. The other is in the frontal lobe, and that would be the motor. If we look back at the homunculus, we can see that if we superimpose electrodes over the homunculus, we can get an idea for if we see a particular a paroxysm or, or slowing or some type of LPD, something abnormal on the EEG, we can make sense of, well, what would we expect to see clinically? And say, for example, you have a patient who has left uh, central, left parasagittal LPDs. Well, depending on how high voltage and how much of the brain is complicit in that discharge, but we could kind of say, well, C3 is around this area. So we would expect to see maybe some hand twitching in that region uh, and also maybe some facial twitching because C3 is going to cover a relatively broad area of the homunculus. However, CZ, right along the midline, if there's an issue there, which is near the uh, anterior cerebral artery, you can see that this is going to affect the lower extremities. And as you move down across the homunculus, you start with the lower extremities with the toes, and then you move up ankle, knees, hip. And as you move towards the hand, you, you're approaching the C3, area and then the facial area right here and then as you go down you see the t3 that temporal electrode is going to be recording activity which is closest to the homunculus part where you see uh, uh, mouth movement right so so a lot of times in temporal lobe epilepsy you see these this lip smacking or, or some type of mouth automatisms. And that kind of makes sense because T3 or that temporal electrode is going to be really active because it's a temporal lobe seizure and it's over the area of the homunculus. T3 is, it's over area of the brain, viewing this through the prism of the homunculus and the motor strip where you would see, uh, or you would expect to see mouth movement, lips movement, just based on where that electrode is placed relative to the distribution of the um, of the motor strip. Okay, so this patient had frequent seizures over the left central region. Well, left central, right in here, 
we can see that this is going to be hand more or less we, we expect this region to be affected and they indeed did have a twitching of that region so it did line up with what we would expect okay so this is the type of question that you should expect on the exam and you want to integrate what you know about the homunculus for this okay and you also might have a question where they ask you about uh, the anterior cerebral artery the middle cerebral artery so on and so forth so it's good to also incorporate knowledge of how if one of those cerebral arteries experiences a stroke, how that would impact different regions of the homunculus. You can see, and, and they'll give you this, you can see in this image right here that they're showing you the central sulcus, this little kind of curved line. And this person, let's just say there's a person here, uh, we can only see their brain. They are looking to the left from our perspective, so they're looking off to the left side of the page. The reason you're going to record mouth automatisms with the temporal lobe seizure is not that the motor control units in the brain for mouth movement are in the temporal lobe, it's that that T3 electrode is just really close to the area of the frontal lobe in the motor strip. So the discharge is high enough amplitude where that T3 electrode is picking it up. But that doesn't imply that it's that the motor strip is housed in the temporal lobe. Just the electrode's close enough to record it. So this patient is looking to the left and we can see now, you, I, I think from the ones I've seen, the questions, they're going to give you some type of visual guide here to show you that central sulcus. And here's another trick for these questions. Since there is some variability between patients, I mean, just sit it on subcortical mapping subtype for one of our uh, pre-surgical candidates, and you'll see that, you know, there's variability between the motor strip, what causes when you stimulate a patient during mapping, you know, what causes some lip twitching in one patient, the motor unit might, the motor area might be a little bit different than another patient. So they're not going to give you a question, say, for example, they give you the context of, well, there's a patient who is experiencing right-sided uh, lip twitching. Uh, which two electrodes are complicit. So it's unlikely they're going to give you two electrodes which are really close together because really it could be either of those. So, for example, they're not going to say 43 and 44 and then another choice would be 35 and 36. Or for as far as like hand movement, let's go a little bit further up on the homunculus. They're probably not going to say 13 and 21 it may be 20 and 21, something that that's too close. It could be either one. So they're, so look for that. They're going to be, the pairs are going to be separated far enough from each other. So it should be clear what the answer is. And just remember that you want to think contralaterally. So if the patient is having cl clinical phenomena or clinical features on the right side, you want to think about the left side and, okay. you know, and vice versa. Here's a question. A patient is making chewing motions and lip smacking based on the homunculus and grid. Which contacts would you expect to see discharges? Now, you're going to have multiple choice, um, and that's going to help kind of rein in where you should be looking. Because, again, there is going to be a little bit of variability. But chewing motions and lip smacking, uh, that's going to be lower down on the motor strip it's not going to be up here see at the top would be the toes at the very top so around cz toes and then as you move le ankle legs and then you get into the hand and then you get into the face so lips are going to be 
kind of in this region. So you would look for a question, an answer that had something like 35, 36. Okay, so chewing motions and lip smacking. Okay, so we can see right here, right here, that lips and mass, it should say chewing, but it says, yeah, mastication to right in here. So the, see, you can see chewing, which is also called mastication is, is really low. So lip smacking is a, so really from the lower temporal lobe all the way, or pardon me, from the lower frontal lobe all the way down and even lower right before the temporal lobe begins is what we should expect. So it's definitely, but there's a range because if there's a lip smacking, it's not just going to be down here with the chewing. It's going to come up a little bit. So it's going to be a broader area. So right now, we can go ahead and throw out 53. It's a, it's over the temporal lobe. If you had like a standard surface array of electrodes, like I said, you know, you would expect P3 to pick it up. But look, if you have all of these direct electrodes placed on the brain, it would make more sense for the most active electrode to truly be over that region of the motor strip. This is way down here in the temporal lobe that the motor strip stops and it stops about right here. Now, 20 and 21 are very close together. I don't think they're gonna make somebody choose between 20 and 21. So these are distractors. And this is a little bit higher up. If CZ is at the very top here, so CZ is going to be about right here. T3, more or less, it's going to be recording from about right here. What's halfway between T3 and CZ is going to be C3. Well, if we kind of picture on the homunculus, what's halfway between the top where the legs are in the ankle and the feet are affected and uh, chewing and the mastication, we could see that it's going to be like the so here's the, the feet, the ankle, the legs, all the way down here is chewing face and lips. Well, up here would be around C3 would be kind of like the hand. And then we fingers, and then we start getting into the face. So my answer would be 43 because it's lower down on the homunculus where you would expect um, that type of activity to be and, and then notice that chewing so mastication and lip smacking um 20 and 21 are so close together that makes me think that they're not the answer and they're too high they're too far away from that region if we superimpose or try to visualize the homunculus it's not they're going to be up more towards uh say the hands in that that region so this is the sylvian fissure this is what separates this is the the partition between the frontal lobe from here over and then the parietal lobe from here over so but it separates you know the temporal lobe from the lobes above it so 43 based on this drawing where the grid is is not in the temporal lobe and the motor strip extends down, you know, pretty darn far. You can see it extends right there. And this is the temporal lobe, by the way. So it goes, mm -hmm. it keeps going until the temporal lobe begins. Our answer in this particular question, that 43, or I think it was 43, was placed around right here. The 20 and 21, they were more up here and they were side by side. That's tricky. I don't think they, because either one of those would record the activity, if that was the real answer, you can kind of eliminate 53 immediately because it's in the temporal lobe. And then you can see these two are side by side. That's kind of a red flag. But just knowing the homunculus, just remember that right where that temporal lobe begins, so for the uh, sensory strip and the motor strip, motor strips in the frontal lobe, sensory strips in the parietal lobe, but they're smacked just beside each other they're adjacent to each other if this was a yeah if this was a question about the sensory system and say they were experiencing right-sided mouth tingling or trouble swallowing or something 
then you would just back it up to beyond that threshold. A little, see, so 44 is just behind that. I mean, we can't really see where the central sulcus extends, but we can we can infer that it does. So, you know, if you had like a right-sided hand tingling or some type of, then we would we would think of right right in here in this region, just posterior to the central sulcus. If there was hand movement, it would be into the frontal lobe on this side. Okay, so we have right-sided facial twitching. We can immediately, without any worry or uncertainty, exclude 38 because 38 is in the sensory region, right? It's behind the central sulcus. It's in the parietal lobe. So we can throw that one out. Now let's look at our other two choices. So I did say that if you had two adjacent, that would be tricky, they shouldn't do that. but. But notice that 19 is way, well, relatively shifted a good distance anterior. So what they're saying here is, do you know where the central sulcus is and where the motor strip is? 19 is just out here in no man's land. It's too far away from the motor strip. We expect to see the activity, which is kind of right on the motor strip. 38 is excluded. Why is 6 excluded? Sensor 6 is shifted up closer towards CZ and 28 seems to be mm, more or less, well, not, maybe not halfway, but significantly further away from CZ and closer to the C3 region. So we've already excluded two, we've excluded 38, we've excluded 19, why is it 28 and why is it not six? We're looking for right-sided facial twitching. Let's look on the homunculus. Up here towards CZ, which six is shifted towards, we would expect more of the hand, thumb, fingers. But you can see that 28 is not as low as that first question we had, right? where we were all the way down here with mastication. There was also some lip smacking, but definitely chewing. We're just seeing facial twitching. Well, where's the face on the homunculus? We go up to about right here. So it makes sense that if we go up on the homunculus, as compared to that last question, with the chewing versus the now facial twitching, we're also going to go up with the numbers. So where 43 was the complicit electrode, we're going to go up just a bit. And what do we see? What's that electrode? It's going to be number 28. 